My name is Reynard Tang, and I'm the president of the Law Institute of Victoria. I'm like, uh, very pleased to welcome you all here today. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I offer my respects to their elders past and present. I'm pleased to welcome today's special guest speaker, the Honourable Chief Justice Marilyn Warren AC, who we will hear from shortly. As well as our members, I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, former LIV President and our partner at Moore's Legal, Andrew Scott, and also those members of the LIV Council who have joined us today. Today's event, hosted by the Law Institute, is proudly sponsored by Pitcher Partners. I'd like to thank Pitcher Partners for their continued support of our flagship event, and their involvement is greatly appreciated. Marilyn Warren was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court nearly 10 years ago. In an interview with the Law Institute Journal soon after her appointment, the then new Chief Justice succinctly and confidently stated her aim for the Supreme Court. Excellence, she said. In a word, excellence. I wish to see the court at the top as it should be and to have the respect of not just the state but the entire nation and be regarded as one of the finest courts in the country. In a criminal jurisdiction, there have been many significant advancements in the administration of the Supreme Court. For years, the Court of Appeal battled, battled with a growing backlog of criminal appeals despite the fact that each year the court had increased the number of appeals finalised. The backlog grew from 300 in 2006 to more than 650 in early 2010. In 2011, the Chief Justice introduced wide-ranging reforms to the criminal appeals to clear the backlog. The most significant change was the introduction of intensive case management of individual criminal appeals by specialist criminal lawyers employed in the Court of Appeal Registry. The approach guaranteed early identification of issues, allowed prompt listing of urgent appeals, and facilitated the delivery of judgment on the day of the hearing. The change, along with other reforms to the court's processes, has had a profound impact. Twelve months after their introduction, there was an almost 50 per cent reduction in the backlog of appeals, and this good record continues. In the civil area, there had been concerns that the New South Wales Supreme Court and the Federal Court were often forums of choice for large-scale commercial litigation, in preference to the Supreme Court of Victoria. In typical fashion, the Chief Justice also met this challenge head-on, and with a trademark focus on excellence. In opening the inaugural Supreme Court of Victoria Commercial Law Conference in 2009, the Chief Justice delivered a paper titled Current Issues in Commercial Law. In a present, pre presentation, the Chief Justice posed the following questions. Why a conference and why here in Melbourne? She continued saying that the answers were short and simple. And I quote, Melbourne is a centre for litigation excellence. Our litigators take pride in being up to date but more so, they take a leadership role on the national commercial stage. A key contribution to litigation excellence in Victoria has been the introduction by the Supreme Court in 2009 of its commercial court. The court, which is a specialist institution within the Commercial and Equity Division, comprises the five commercial lists, the corporations list, the Victorian taxation appeals list, the arbitration list and the admiralty list. The court was introduced with a clear intent of increasing the amount of commercial litigation in Victoria, and it has achieved its aims. In 2010, a year after the commercial court began operation, the LIV, via its litigation lawyer section, noted that the commercial court had almost certainly exceeded expectations and was delivering service at a level to which all courts should aspire. As noted in the Supreme Court's most recent annual report for 2011-12, in the commercial court, 1,422 cases were commenced and 1,362 finalised, a clearance rate of more than 95 per cent. I believe the Chief Justice will also talk shortly about further reforms to civil appeals. These are impressive results, made even more so when one remembers they have been achieved in a building which first opened in 1884, some 129 years ago and counting. As beautiful and as majestic as the Supreme Court is, the time is long overdue for the court to move to modern facilities. As the Chief Justice has said, Victoria is being left behind by other superior court facilities. Every state, territory and federal superior jurisdiction across, across Australia either has or is progressing towards modern court facilities for the highest courts. Victorian citizens and litigators need a new modern facility in Victoria. The Law Institute has long supported the call for a new Supreme Court facilities and today I, I again urge the State Government to show leadership in this area and commit to the development of a new court complex. We believe it's possible 
to develop a viable multi-court facility in the court precinct using a public-private partnership model with aligned legal uses such as for the Law Library of Victoria, <coughs> barristers' chambers and perhaps even some law firms to minimise the overall cost to government. Time constraints prohibit me from listing the many other areas in which the Chief Justice has championed, improved and increased the daily work of the Supreme Court, always with an eye to excellence. Of course, the daily business of the court is not the sole focus of the head of any jurisdiction. An area in which the Chief Justice has been a great champion of the judiciary and the legal profession has been in relation to judicial independence. As recently as March this year, the Chief Justice spoke at a meeting at Parliament House on the separation of powers and the financial independence of the judiciary. In fact, the Chief Justice has presented many speeches and engaged with the media many times on this crucial topic, stating in one presentation that judicial independence lies at the heart of our democracy. May I observe that with successive governments of both state and federal level seeking to encroach on the independence of the courts and the profession, it's reassuring and unfortunately necessary from time to time that this state's Chief Justice has been and continues to be such a strong advocate for our independence. It's something of vital importance as we continue the inexorable journey towards a national profession with the anticipated enactment of uniform legal professional legislation initially applicable in Victoria and New South Wales before the end of this year. The Chief Justice has also been a strong advocate on the issue of gender equality. And while she has argued the case for women, and especially women lawyers, in speeches and by the media, she has also led by example. The Chief Justice's appointment in 2003 marked the first time a woman had been appointed to lead the Supreme Court of Victoria in its then more than 150 year history. To achieve the standing of Chief Justice is to enter a rarefied level of excellence and achievement within the legal profession. To achieve this, while at the same time breaking down barriers based on gender, makes the achievement all the more remarkable. In fact, throughout her trailblazing career, the Chief Justice has broken many glass ceilings. Her articles were served in the office of a public trustee with 10 solicitors, all of whom were male. Then, in 1976, as a first year solicitor, she applied for a position in a criminal law branch of the Crown Solicitor's Office. As the Chief Justice has recalled elsewhere, she attended an interview with the Assistant Crown Solicitor, who was in charge of the crim criminal law branch. While he was, as she put it, a notoriously pleasant and kind man, the conversation went on longer than expected. Eventually, the interviewer, with some awkwardness, made his startling claim that the then Crown Solicitor did not consider that women should be employed in the criminal law branch. In fact, even the typists were male because the Crown Solicitor did not consider that women should, be, should read the matters contained in depositions in nasty cases such as rape trials. It all seems so remarkable nowadays. It was anything but when the Chief Justice began her career. Roughly six months before her appointment as Chief Justice, the then Supreme Court judge told more than 200 people at the Women Lawyer Achievements Awards, that the majority of whom were female, that it was their duty to gender to accept all opportunities for advancement, even if it meant making personal sacrifice. That stirring speech, which also focused strongly on inequitable briefing practices for female barristers, reverberated not only through Parliament House's Grand Queen's Hall that night, but thereafter across the state and across the country. It resulted in moves by the Law Institute, the Victorian Bar, the Law Council of Australia, and the then Victorian state and federal governments to redress inequitable briefing practices for female barristers. It was a speech that truly put gender back on the agenda. Soon it will be time to hear from the Chief Justice herself as to what is currently on her agenda. But for now, please relax, enjoy your lunch, and I will be back to introduce the Chief Justice shortly. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions following address. Thank you. For Chief Justice Warren, excellence is the rule, not the exception, by which her life is measured. The Chief Justice is a graduate of the Monash University. She commenced her legal career in the Victorian Public Service in 1974 and was employed in various government legal offices. She was later appointed an Assistant Chief Parliamentary Counsel. The Chief Justice signed the role of Victorian Bar in 1985 and practised predominantly in the areas of administrative law, commercial law and town planning. In 1997, she was appointed Queen's Counsel. In 1998, she was appointed to the Supreme Court of Victoria. In November 2003, she made history when she was elevated to the position of Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Victoria. The Chief Justice was admitted to the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa 
by Monash University in 2004. In June 2005, she was made a companion in the Order of Australia and in April 2006 assumed the role of Lieutenant Governor of Victoria. The Chief Justice also chairs and supports a number of bodies, including Victoria Women Lawyers, the Council of Legal Education and the Interim Board for the Law Library of Victoria.